Hello, and welcome to Analysis with me, Oliver McTernan. Ukraine's president, Petro Poroshenko, has today called for a short ceasefire and peace plan for the conflict-ridden east of the country. The president said that the plan, which was announced soon after a telephone conversation with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, would be implemented shortly. European leaders, including France's president, Francois Hollande, and the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, had also been in contact with Putin after recent weeks saw a marked increase in the number of casualties in Ukraine's violent conflict. Separatists shot down a Ukrainian military plane, killing all 49 people on board, whilst more than 30 armed fighters were killed or wounded in Luhansk region. An explosion on a gas pipeline was described as a possible terrorist attack, and numerous journalists, photographers and translators have also been killed. But what can be expected after President Porozhenko's latest call for peace? Will his offer of a ceasefire be accepted? Well, joining me to discuss this are Professor Bill Browning here in the studio, Professor of Law at Birkbeck University in London, Irina Telkeki, a associated, uh, uh, pr the first vice president associated of the Association of the Ukrainians in Great Britain. And on the line, we're joined by Professor Alexei Haran, a professor of comparative politics at the Kiev Mohila Academy in Ukraine, and Dr. Richard Connolly, a senior lecturer at the Center for Russian and Eastern European Studies at the University of B Birmingham. Well, welcome to you all. But before we start our discussion, let's look at this report. Russia has circulated a new UN resolution on Ukraine in a fresh effort to get the deeply divided Security Council to address the humanitarian solution and escalating conflict. Ukrainian Prime Minister Petro Poroshenko said the peace plan would be implemented shortly. According to the decisions that the Security and Defense Council will adopt today, a ceasefire will be offered as the start of the implementation of the peace plan of the president of Ukraine. The proposed ceasefire follows an attack by pro-Russian rebels who shot down a military plane in Luhansk in the bloodiest day of fighting in eastern Ukraine since the conflict began. The crash and the 49 deaths were a big blow to the Ukrainian armed force and the Ukrainian government. The plane carried a full load of heavy equipment, ammunition, personnel, armored vehicles and paratroopers. So when we shot it down, it was destroyed, leaving troops stationed at the airport without reinforcement. Russia is likely to face an uphill struggle because of the widespread opposition to its annexation of the Crimea in March and the activities of pro-Russian military in the east. I believe that what is going on in our country is unacceptable. We elected a pro-European president, but there was no and is no pro-European parliament in Ukraine. People are dying in Maidan and in the east, and nothing is being done. Deputies in the parliament are just sitting there, wasting their time and earning money. On Monday, Russia submitted a third draft solution on Ukraine crisis, on humanitarian and political situation to the United Nations. Russia expressed disappointment on the failure of receiving any condemnation from the Security Council on the attacks on the Russian embassy in Kiev. Crimean Tatars and other ethnic minorities in the country are concerned for their future in an increasingly divided country. Following the annexation of Crimea to Russia, Human Rights Watch and other groups began recording the disappearance of leading Tatars community activists. Both Ukraine and Russia are trying to find a diplomatic solution which would improve the country's humanitarian crisis. Many argue at races is still far away. Awesta Abdelmanan, Islam Channel. People are dying 
Irina, what chances do you think this ceasefire will have? I think the first thing to say is that this conflict would never have started if Russia had not encouraged the separatists and armed the separatists. There is so much evidence now of Russian arms, Russian mercenaries coming into Ukraine to fight a fight that the Ukrainian people themselves do not want. Everybody wants a ceasefire. Nobody wants war. Everyone wants peace. But that doesn't depend on Ukraine alone. It depends on Russia as well. And one of the things that we have not heard from Russia at all in any of their statements to the UN is any call for the separatists to lay down their arms and but talk to the Ukrainian government. We're told government. this call for a ceasefire, short as it is, um, came after a conversation with Putin. Um, do you think that indicates that Putin is willing to ask the, the separatists to I think, also I think, adhere to it? I think uh, you always need to have a certain degree of optimism. Mm. But over the last few months, we have heard many promises from President Putin. We've heard, we heard there were no Russian troops in Crimea. We have heard there are no Russian weapons in Ukraine. We have heard him promise to tighten up controls on the Russian side of the border. And so far, not a single one of those promises has been kept. We do hope it's different this time, but Bill, I'm afraid we can't be very optimistic. You, you know the region well. Would you have any hopes that Putin will actually act on his words this time? Well, I think there are, <coughs> um, not, not to disagree with my colleague, but I think um, one can look at it slightly more optimistically in the sense that the separatists who are absolutely not representative in Luhansk or Donetsk expected Russia to arrive in force, I mean Russian troops that mm -hmm. is, and that didn't happen. And I think it's been very clear from the Russian side that they are not going to intervene. And I think equally it's very interesting since the election of uh, President Poroshenko that uh, Russia's approach, and so Putin, but other Russian leaders as well, have not um, in any way condemned the election. I'm far from it. I think they show that they want actually to work with President Poroshenko. I think behind this, of course, is the issue of payment for the gas. And I, I would have thought that it's in Russia's interest to have a government in Kiev with Pays which up. it can deal to actually get some money. Mm -hmm. And while this conflict goes on in the East, of course, you know, that is all on hold, so... Uh, Professor Alexei, are you fearful of a Russian intervention at this stage, or do you think there is hope with this ceasefire? Ceasefire? Uh, I agree with what Irina has said, because uh, let's analyze what is the nature of the conflict. It's not civil war within Ukraine. It's undeclared war of Russia, and it's so-called hybrid war, because Russia is sending its special forces, mercenaries, it's arming uh, some local people, criminals, lumpenized people. So it's real war, which is waged by Russia in the east of Ukraine. And definitely, if Russia would behave differently, the conflict would be solved easily and without uh, without many victims, as we see it right now, including civilians. Unfortunately, Russia doesn't behave like that, and the intervention actually continues, and arms is coming from Russian border, including tanks, including rocket artillery, uh, and other stuff. Many mercenaries from Northern Caucasus are coming from Russian borders. Can you imagine this situation? So, unfortunately, I am to agree with Irina that we cannot trust Putin. A lot would de depend on, uh, on his position, whether the border would be closed. But I am not sure Putin will do that. One of the things which can persuade him to, uh, to close the border, or at least to stop supporting uh, separatists, is Western pressure. We shouldn't, uh, we should remember about sanctions which were introduced by the West and which should be increased because there's no change in Russian behavior. 
Well, Richard, can I, can I bring in Richard now? Richard, would you agree that Western sanctions are called for, that that's the only way that Russia will, in fact, um, cease provoking the situation, if that analysis is right? Uh, on the specific issue of sanctions, my view is that sanctions would only harden the Russian position rather than make it uh, more likely to uh, bend to our wishes, so to speak. Um, I think this is ultimately down to an issue that Russia considers to be of uh, deep importance um, to it. As a result, then, I, I would um, suggest that the elite are prepared to pay a high price um, to ensure that their interests are respected in and around eastern Ukraine, um, and Ukraine more generally. So, personally, I don't think sanctions will make too much difference. And there's, a, and there's also a limit to how much mm. we can increase sanctions. I mean, we can't realistically say that we're going to place an embargo on oil and gas exports, for example, because that would affect us just as much as it would affect Russia. I mean, there's Oil markets are tightening anyway because of surprise disruptions in Iraq and Libya and elsewhere. Um, to add further fuel, excuse the pun, to the fire um, wouldn't help Western economies um, either. So I think there are limits to sanctions, and I don't think sanctions would work or are working anyway. Bill, is it a matter of Russian interests, or are there genuine grievances in the east of the country that are not being addressed? Well, um, taking this in two ways. First of all, um, the proportion of people who describe themselves as ethnic Russian, according to the last census, is about 17 percent. I doubt if it's more than that. A lot more people in Ukraine use the Russian language, and one of the issues has been the recognition of that use. And in fact, there is a law that was brought in in 2012, uh, which makes provision for uh, regional use of the Russian language as well as the state language Ukrainian. And if you remember, right back at the beginning of this crisis, uh, the Ukraine, Ukrainian parliament repealed the law, but the acting president, Tur Turchinov, um, <coughs> uh, repealed the repeal, yeah. as it were. So that law is still in force. Mm. And one of the processes now taking place is recognition for Russian. I think that there's a second issue, which of course is that the annexation of Crimea was an illegal use of force by mm. Russia. Mm. And that issue can't be allowed to go away, I think. And, yes. you know, so yes. but it's on the question of sanctions, though, um, I think there are three problems. First of all, Britain, uh, BP, uh, has major investments in Russia in the oil and gas sector with the asset, former assets of UCOS, as a matter of fact, is making huge money. France is, is selling warships to Russia at this moment. The new flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet is a French Tonnerre-class assault ship. And Germany, of course, is thoroughly implicated with Russia on mm. the question of gas supply. So I don't see sanctions actually happening, I, nor would they. I agree with my colleague, they I wouldn't do any good. Putin described recently as a good chess player. He makes a move in Crimea and then creates another move and distracts us all. Well, but we really, mustn't lose sight of Crimea, can I, I think. Yes, a good point. Yeah. Can I come to you on this question of grievance? Do you really think <laughs> that um, this is not a, a grievance-driven conflict, but it's more outside interests? I don't. I don't think it's a grievance-driven conflict. Yes. That's not to say that the Donbass region does not have. Uh, its economic and social problems. But the conflict was manufactured. There was never any problem between those who spoke Ukrainian and those who spoke Russian. Mm. Many Ukrainians, as Bill said, speak Ukrainian and Russian. We saw on Maidan in Kyiv the number of speakers but on the stage at Maidan who spoke Russian without any reaction from the crowd. So there was never any issue of Russian speakers being persecuted or downtrodden mm. in any part of Ukraine. However, I do think that Donbass, as a former industrial region, uh, which uh, needs very significant modernization, does have uh, legitimate concerns about the government in Kyiv and whether it truly understands the concerns of that region and uh, about what its future will be. Mm.
So but, there, there are some deep-seated, I think, social and economic yes. social and economic issues. Issues that need but, to be I would argue that they're no worse than some of the social and economic issues that, for example, the northeast of England had um, after a, a lot of its heavy industry closed mm. down. Pr Professor Alexi, um, deep social economic issues in the east of the country, would you agree with that analysis? Yeah, I fully agree with that. Actually, Donbass is not modernized, but we should remember that the people who governed Donbass for uh, recent decades uh, were people like President Yanukovych. So actually, and they were elected and supported by uh, electors in Donbass. So there were no if there are grievances in Donbass. They should be addressed, first of all, to former elite, to President Yanukovych, who escaped uh, the country. It's important to stress that the conflict which you see now in the East is not ethnic one, is not religious, is not connected with language. Definitely there are people who have some, you know, separatist views, but all the polls have shown that they are in minority. More, <clears throat> more of the, uh, most part of the population, even in the east of the country, they, they would like to stay in Ukraine. This is confirmed by all the polls. So if there were no Russian infiltration, there would be no conflict like that. And may I come back also to the question of sanctions? Uh, Crimea was mentioned. Let me remind that what happened in Crimea was the first case of annexation in post-World War Europe. There were no annexations like that uh, since the beginning of World War II. So previous annexations in Europe were done by Hitler and Stalin. So this is the question, is actually to Western democracies, democracies, how to react to that, whether they would pursue the policy of appeasement of aggressor or neo-Munich policy, which we know which led to very dramatic consequences and led to World War II. So now it's very important to to remember about values, to remember about promises, about territorial integrity of Ukraine. In 1904, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal, which was British, French, and Chinese combined together mm. in exchange for territorial guarantees, which were received by, from U.S., U.K., and paradoxically Russia. I, I take that point. I'd like to bring Richard back in. Richard. We started off with saying what chances had the ceasefire got. Um, what's your comment on that, please? Um, my view on it is that it's a, it's a useful start. It's, uh, any longer-term peace deal would need to start somewhere. Um, but I think that the, this whole crisis is, has been caused by a sense in Russia um, that its strategic uh, interest in Ukraine um, is, a, is under threat. Um, and as a result, I think it's the strategic issues that need to be um, solved if this, if any peace deal is going to be a lasting peace deal. Um, and so if we're talking about what sort of strategic issues Russia considers to be important, then I think U Ukraine's role in any potential uh, future European security uh, structures, such as NATO um, or elsewhere, Russia was particularly quickly about the fact that the uh, association agreement did contain several clauses um, available on the internet that you would fit that made reference to um, integration with European uh, military and security structures. And this is something that I think the Russians have always considered to be um, a red line. Um, there also has to be an agreement over in uh, gas, gas prices and how much gas will be um, uh, sold to Ukraine for and in what quantity and such like. Mm. Um, what is the relationship? But, that, but that's what the if the ceasefire takes hold, I mean, those are the issues that will need to be addressed, aren't they? In the immediate um, situation, do you think that the ceasefire will be just an opportunity for the um, separatists to rearm or to, to entrench in their positions? Well, my, my view on this is, is perhaps slightly more optimistic than some others here, is that I don't think that um, the leadership in the Kremlin once this uh, uh, conflict in eastern Ukraine to escalate too much further, 
um, unless it's absolutely necessary, unless it considers its interest to be um, severely undermined. So as a result, my guess would be that the people in the Kremlin um, would be inclined to to go along, to not add more fuel to the fire in eastern Ukraine, uh, at least in the short term. Unless, of course, um, events elsewhere in Ukraine um, suggested that Ukraine was moving closer to Europe and, um, and again, compromising Russia's interests even more. So I don't think that... I, I would imagine in the short run that Russia will be open to, um, to making this deal something more permanent in the future. We'll try and explore that further in the second part of our programme, so do come back after this break.